How many of you feel comfortable with hemodynamics? Just me? <laughs> okay. Well, let's take a look at hemodynamics and talk about it a little bit. If you can understand how to work one of these, you can understand hemodynamics. Because it's the same principles involved in hemodynamics as are involved in managing an IV setup. Okay, when you walk into your patient's room and that IV pump is beeping, you know what to look for. You know what to assess for. As a matter of fact, when that pump is beeping and you walk in, probably from across the room you're already looking at the IV bag to see whether or not the bag is full. As you get closer to the patient's bedside, you're probably looking at the tubing already to see if the tubing is kinked or underneath the patient's body. See, you know how to troubleshoot this. You do this all the time. And you do it so often, it's become automatic. You watch one of your peers, you watch somebody else troubleshoot an IV. And when they walk into that patient's room, it's automatic. They're in there talking to the patient about their discharge, or they're talking about something else. Because we can do this without even having to concentrate on it. We made it so automatic that every time you walk into a patient's room, don't you glance at the IV bags? Every time you do care on a patient, don't you make sure the tubing is not underneath the patient? See, you're troubleshooting this all the time. We made it automatic so we don't even have to think about it. You remember the first time you ever had to troubleshoot an IV pump? Maybe your nursing instructor sent you into a patient's room and said, hey, go down there and find out why that pump keeps beeping. And you walked into the patient's room and you're looking at this thing for like 20 minutes. Right? Trying to figure out what's wrong. See how we made it automatic? And it's because we do it all the time. Now the problem that a lot of people have with hemodynamics is we don't do it all the time. We were taught in nursing school not to speak in hemodynamic terms. Weren't we taught things like Nursing diagnosis. Right, so you walk into your patient's room and you see that something's wrong with your patient. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, you've got to call the physician up and you call her up on the phone and you're telling her this story about the patient. But we've been taught to speak in nursing diagnosis, so you've got to tell her, I don't know, she's got decreased tissue perfusion related to... She's like, what? <coughs> See, because we're not talking the same language. Physicians were taught to speak in hemodynamic terms, and we weren't. So oftentimes what happens is that we end up calling up the physician and saying something like, she just doesn't look good, because we don't know how to put that into words. Now, if I were to do a case study with you on one of those patients who just doesn't look good, can you think of one of those kind of patients? Patients you took care of sometime in the past, they just didn't look good, and you knew something was wrong with that patient, and that patient was not going to do well. If we were to walk through that as a case study, I'll bet you could identify the fact what was going on with that patient. I bet you could come up with a diagnosis of what was going on with that patient and what kind of treatment that patient needed. So you knew what it was, you just didn't know what the terms were, how to talk about it. Okay, so that's one of the problems we've had with hemodynamics. The other problem we've had with hemodynamics is that we've all been taught that it's very difficult. As a matter of fact, when I started in critical care, I had a week-long class on hemodynamics just to make sure that we were confused. <laughs> it's not that hard. If you can understand how to use one of these things, you can understand how to manage hemodynamics. Okay, same principles involved. We have an IV bag here. That's a fluid that's coming to the pump. Now, in hemodynamic terms, we would call that the load before the pump or the preload. See? Preload is fluid volume. Preload is always fluid volume. It's the fluid volume that's coming to the pump. Now we need to have enough preload, we need to have enough fluid volume. Too much is not going to make it better. If this is not working well, is it going to help to hang another bag up there if the bag is full? No. So too much fluid isn't going to make it better. Yet in our patients, oftentimes, the first thing we want to do is to give them more fluid. Now sometimes that helps. And sometimes we get a little bit of a sense of satisfaction out of the fact that the blood pressure came up. Oftentimes the blood pressure comes up temporarily, and then the patient further decompensates. Okay, so when you look at it in a bigger picture, sometimes it's, we're not doing what we think we're, we're really doing with this. 
Okay, so the first thing we want to do is we want to manage that patient's fluid volume. We need to have enough fluid. Too much fluid isn't going to make it better. The next thing, the next component is the pump. We have to make sure the pump is adequately functioning. So we want to make sure the pump is adequately functioning and that it's plugged in. In the case of the heart, we're going to plug it in to its oxygen supply. Next, we have the tubing. The tubing comes after the pump. So it is the load after the pump, or in hemodynamic terms, it would be called the afterload. Right? Okay, so we've got our afterload, and the load after the pump, the tubing, the thing that creates a load after the pump is going to be the tubing getting kinked, or the clamp being closed, or an infiltrated line. All those things cause too much resistance for the pump to have to pump against. So our afterload, the load after the pump, is going to be resistance to pumping. And that's caused by the arterial vasculature. 